You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. All set for your flight? Yep, I've got everything I need. Eye mask, neck pillow, T-Mobile, headphones. Wait, T-Mobile? You bet. Free in-flight Wi-Fi. 15% off all Hilton brands. I never go anywhere without T-Mobile. Same goes from a water bottle, chewing gum, nail clippers, okay, passport. Okay, I'm going to leave you to it. Find out how you can experience travel better at T-Mobile.com slash travel. Qualifying plan required. Wi-Fi were available on select U.S. airlines. Deposit and Hilton Honors membership required for 15% discount. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome to From Beneath the Hollywood Sign. If you love old movies, Hollywood history, or the golden age of filmmaking, you've come to the right place. This is the podcast that talks about amazing stories of Tinseltown from another era and fascinating conversations with writer-producer Steve Kubine and actress-writer Nan McNamara. So, Steve, did Ava Gardner and Howard Hughes have a good relationship? Well, they did until he dislocated her jaw. What? Well, don't worry. She hit him back with an ashtray. From Beneath the Hollywood Sign is the gin joint for you. Recorded in Chicago, Illinois, with your hosts, Ken, Matt, Neil, and Jeff, this is Triviality. The cream of the crop! Hello and welcome to Triviality, the show that was originally going to be called Bestiality until I was outvoted. (laughs) I don't like that Uh, at all. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, nobody likes my intros, but uh, I'm Ken. Uh, I'm with Neil, Jeff, and Matt today. How Matt's you guys doing? Here. Yeah. Hooray. Yeah, Matt's here. How's it going, Matt? How are you feeling? Oh, you know, it's been a while. It's been a while since you've been on an episode. It's been a while. Yeah, I know. No. Yeah. Yeah. What song is that? Who is that again? Stained. Stained, Stained yeah. 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 Right, Jeff? What? <laughs> no, wait, that's the original program. I'm sorry. What are you Yikes. talking about? <laughs> Might be a joke too far, Neil. Yeah. A first for this show, but mm. uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't, don't want to. You could just bleep it. Where it was bleeped. No longer want to hold my head up high. But it hasn't been a while since we had our uh, our guest on the program. It's Aaron Barclay again. How you doing? Hello. I'm still good. Always happy to have you, of course. Always happy to be here. Is this the first uh, instance of the Five Timers Club that we've made allusion to oh. before? Oh. Perhaps, uh, including a bonus episodes, you might be well beyond uh, five times. I've been on at least five now, right? So. You don't <laughs> count. You're what we call one of the uh, regular players. Oh, yeah, so. yeah. Gotcha. So I guess Aaron chooses. Should we do a jacket? Should we do some sort of uh, brooch, bracelet, necklace? What do you think? Mm, a brooch. <laughs> I like it. We'll figure something out. Yeah. Tennis yeah. bracelet. I, I trust your judgment. I don't know why, but I that do. That's a mistake. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I would not do that. <laughs> Well, in addition to being a Patreon supporter, Aaron is, of course, the uh, co-host of the Sports Trivia Face-Off podcast. True. Is that a lead-in? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're do- doing a lot of work over there, Ken. Yeah, I'm trying. <laughs> I'm doing the heavy lifting here. But uh, we also wanted to thank our Patreon supporters. Um, we did hit our goal. Uh, there was some talk on the crop of doing a uh, special rules reading when mm-hmm. we hit that goal. So uh, here it is. Without further ado, the uh, brand new rules guy. Hi, I'm Gilbert Gottfried. Triviality Podcast is two rounds of 20 questions worth 10 points apiece. At halftime, there's a special swing round by this week's host. In the final round, players wager points they've earned for a chance to become the cream of the crop. I am the cream, yeah. The cream of the crop. Yeah, thank you, Gilbert, for yeah. that. Uh, thank you, Gilbert. Yeah. Uh, that was, in fact, Gilbert Don't Godfrey. let our trade secrets go. Um, spe- <laughs> special thanks to uh, crop member Nicole Newlist. Uh, mm-hmm. When we had the poll that Matt put up, she was the one who suggested Gilbert and that ended up winning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as Ken said, though, um, and Jeff can uh, reiterate as well, but thank you so much to all our patrons uh, who are new and, and who've been with us this whole time to help us reach that goal that we had. It uh, means a lot, and um, you know we do this... Uh, we do this because we love it, but it also helps that we have people who uh, enjoy us and support us, and it makes it uh, that much sweeter. Right, Jeff? Yeah, we wouldn't make the show for five people, at least not weekly. Um, <laughs> it's a lot of work. <laughs> so uh, we're really we're really fortunate that we can do that, and it's only because of our patrons that we can continue to do that. And uh, if you can join us on Patreon, we really l- appreciate it. We send people a little bit back in thank you via bonus episodes and stickers, and there's too many things. I'm not going to run down the whole list, mm-hmm. um, but... 
that's uh that's basically it that's yeah, that's the, the support of the show and we wouldn't do it without you so yeah the macho band sticker is pretty great if it's on all of our laptops i love it yeah it and I, I do want to mention that darren has not been fired no we will still have the uh the darren rules reading and mm-hmm. we'll just probably sprinkle gilbert gottfried in every now and again as a special treat yeah it's a little special amuse bouche for uh episodes that yeah, we we'll, think we'll, deserve we'll it. see how we're yeah. how we're feeling if we're feeling a little spicy that day you know Ooh, i like it yeah, yeah a little spicy. boring we get <laughs> use this window dressing Just bring, bring gilbert in to <laughs> spice things up yeah all right so the teams today are going to be uh me and neil yeah that's correct and jeff and matt and i think mm-hmm. we want to do a uh, wager today right wager time Ooh, wager. Jeff's not confident in, in my ability. But I'm not I, confident in my ability. Oh. I have full confidence in you, Matt. You've been rested. You've barely yeah. been on the show. I feel like you've got this. <laughs> I've been uh, studying. Neil, Neil's been going through our suggestions, right? Yeah. So we, we have a few more that you all mentioned on Patreon, but uh, one that was, I believe, maybe the first one mentioned um, from our listener and uh, Patreon supporter, Chris Eve, was uh, Hug to <sighs> the tune of Take My Breath Away from Top Gun for the entirety of the song. Mm hmm. So um, I guess we're going to have to hug and... Yes, my know. guess is you'll have to hug. I <laughs> This is torture for me. I hate to be touched, so let's... <laughs> it's just... <laughs> and it's even worse if it's me. Yeah. It's so not, this is not, not going to end well, possibly. All right, so in honor of the wager, let's pick team names of uh, different romantic ballads. So what, what romantic ballad do you guys want to be, Matt and Jeff? Um, oh, I, I hadn't considered it. Uh, By Lomos by <laughs> Enrique Iglesias. <laughs> Is that, that is by Lamos. That is Iglesias, yeah. right? Yeah. What do you want to be? Uh, cherry pie by Warren. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> All right, teams yeah. by Lamos and cherry pie oh, by Warren. I would win for hot for teacher, but that's okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. They're I mean, both romantic. We're fine. Yeah, let's do that. Well, without further ado, right? We yeah. say that sometimes. Let's throw it to Aaron for the start of the game. All right. I want to lead into this by saying. Um, I have been working on this game on and off for a while, and I apologize to Dustin Rush. I did not take this idea from him, but it did line up with the game he hosted for you guys a while ago now. Well, we've already forgotten about it then. It's uh, all Sir Mix a lot. I wish. I'm not quite as clever as Dustin, but this was a cool way to sort of focus my uh, focus where I was going. All right. So round one, question one, category is that's great. It starts with an earthquake. Hmm. The quake is a story that describes a great earthquake and the earth bearing witness to the actions of men. The quake is the English translation of the 99th chapter of what ancient book? Did you just write quake? No. Okay. (laughs) I know what he wrote. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) I've played quake. Does that help? We're going to lock in. Is oh. that what you decided to go with then? Yeah, I think so. The yeah. Quran? I, I I think it might be. Yeah, the Quran has uh, more than 100 books or chapters. So Okay. I, I feel that might be our, our right answer. Okay, we're going to lock in with the Quran. As did we. Nice job. It is, in fact, the Quran. Off to a strong start. Yay. Ooh. How confident were you before he said that? Uh, that's what I was going oh, okay. I, I okay. threw Tuesdays with Maury at Penn, and he said no. So <laughs> well, he got like four chapters. He like meets yeah. Maury. He talks to him for a while. Maury dies. Mm. Whoa, spoilers. And then he, oh, gets, spoilers. Then he yeah. gets sad. Wait, so. and you're telling me that they don't meet on Tuesdays? What is this? I mean, after a while, they yeah. don't. Well, they find out who the father is. And right. then chapter five is when they puppet Maury's body <laughs> all around to <laughs> pretend he's still alive. Jonathan Just Silver. To borrow his week, uh, Just his, the weekends. Uh, yeah. yeah. We get summer <laughs> house. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the old band's back together. Matt's here. All right. Question two category is birds. The two main characters in The Birds connect in a pet shop when Mitch Brenner is seeking to purchase a pair of what monogamous species of parrot for his sister's 11th birthday? Hmm. Two questions about books. Don't like it. Uh, it's a movie, Matt. Well, that's bad news for me. <laughs> Do you know? Bad news books. Mm-hmm. No, it would be a guess at this point. All right, we're locked in. Okay, all we need to think about is how many bird species do you know? Well, made for life. Macaw? I weirdly thought maybe turtle dove. Maybe they're okay. like not named correctly. Two turtle doves, like in Home Alone 2. Right. Yeah, you're right. The correct movie we should be thinking about <laughs> here. Right. Maybe they're parrots or something else. I don't know. Can you think of any other bird species that made basically Penguins? Peng- penguins as a uh, Pen- penguin as a uh, penguin. think penguins Benedict. are parrots is that what we're going for <laughs> I, yeah I, I thought a macaw is definitely a parrot isn't it yeah or is it a different kind of bird it's well, a it might be a parrot it's a casino town right yeah yeah 
It might be a parrot. I don't All know. All right. Well, then let's lock in with it because I don't know. Okay. You don't like turtle doves? I don't like turtle doves. Okay. I don't think it's a parrot. Fine. I will defer to Matt. We'll go macaw. Okay. So I believe macaws are parrots. I don't know if they're monogamous, but I believe the ones that you always see in pairs are cockatoos, cockatiels. Mm-hmm. So that's what we went with. You may see cockatoos or macaws in pairs, but the answer is lovebirds. Oh. oh. Even oh. easier than we thought. Oh, Hitchcock. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Symbolism there. A little on the nose, if you ask me, actually. <laughs> my, my apologies. Category three, snakes. An adder is a specific type of venomous snake. Black adder is the eponymous character on a series of BBC pseudo-historical sitcoms. What Englishman who briefly pursued a PhD in electrical engineering before turning to comedy played Edmund Blackadder? We're locked in. Okay. All right. So there's two guys I know are on this show, uh, Rowan Atkinson and uh, Hugh Laurie. Which one do you think? Uh, oh, shoot. Uh, you're right. They're both on that show. Um, Let's go with Rowan Atkinson. That sounds That sounds right. All right. If it was a medical degree, were you going to go with Hugh Laurie? I don't know what I was going to go with, but <laughs> no. if it sounded right, I was going to go with okay. my gut. Um, yeah, widely... Widely known for being one of the quietest uh, comedians because uh, he's a huge physical comedy guy. Um, I know he has at least a master's in some engineering field, so we said Rowan Atkinson. And it is Rowan Atkinson. Yay. Question four, category is an airplane. The Wright brothers are generally credited with the invention of the airplane for five points. According to its license plates, state quarter, and tourist information, what state was first in flight? For your second five points... Which state's quarter dubs it the birthplace of aviation pioneers? In addition to being the home state of the Wright brothers, this state boasts some truly out-of-this-world natives. All right, so we are locked in. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. So uh, I, I see, uh, Neil, you've written down South Carolina and Ohio. Ohio, yeah. I think it was North Carolina and Ohio. Yeah, North Carolina does sound a little bit better now that you say that. I'm trying to picture the license plates. I'm fine changing it to that. But okay. is, is Ohio correct? I think so. I think so, too. All right. We're going to go North Carolina and Ohio. Mm-hmm. I think it was Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Right? Yep. Yeah. And uh, the Ohio in question, I'm pretty sure they feature an astronaut on the back of their state quarter. So I believe the out of this world person was Armstrong. Was he from Ohio? Uh, that's, that's correct. So, yeah, we said North Carolina and Ohio. That is correct. I play tested this game with my regulars on Thursday night. The North Carolina one was a total gimme for us. But I thought it might play a little harder with you guys, but it did not. Yeah, North Carolina and Ohio. Um, in addition to the Wright brothers and Neil Armstrong, John Glenn was also born in Ohio. Okay. And the joke is they were so ashamed to be from there, they had to go to space, and it was still not far <laughs> enough away. <laughs> Ohio. Uh, that's funny. Take that, Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> Number five, category, Lenny Bruce is not afraid. In fact, he fearlessly took, this to, took to the stage with comedy routines that integrated satire, politics, religion, sex, and such vulgarity that in 1964, he was convicted of obscenity. In 2003, New York Governor George Pataki took what alliterative action on Lenny Bruce's behalf? It was the first time this particular thing had been done in New York State. Ooh. Alliterative action. Okay. I think we're going to lock in over here. Yep. Posthumous pardon. Oh, I like he that. He was pardoned after he died. Okay. Uh, yeah, we uh, we went with the uh, very, very short-lived uh, professor of the Defense Against the Dark Arts and Harry Potter, Posthumous Pardon. <laughs> <laughs> it was Posthumous Pardon. All right. That's Crush- killing it. Crushing the game so, so far. So after five, I think uh, Cherry Pie over here, four out of five. So we got 40 points. Mm-hmm. What about you guys? Uh, Same. Yep, dancing our way to 40. All right. Tie with, tied at 40. All right. <laughs> All right, number six, Eye of the Hurricane. The 2006 Stanley Cup final was between the Carolina Hurricanes and what Western Conference team who are making their first final appearance since their cup win in 1990? If it helps, this matchup was, as of this recording, the only Stanley Cup final to feature two former World Hockey Association franchises. I should know this offhand, but I don't. Um, That was what I was hoping. I'm just skipping around in the corner over here. I... (laughs) <laughs> All this was foreign to me. Neil's doing jump rope. Maybe. Did not expect the hockey question to be the buzzsaw. Sorry, guys. Yeah, who'd they become? No, they're still there. They're just really bad now. <laughs> okay, they're locked in. So 90, um, see, 91 starts. I think that's when, when Pittsburgh was uh, in those Stanley Cups. I'm trying to, and if it's the Red Wings, I don't think so because – they're an original six team, so it's not them. Uh, I kind of like the Oilers. Um, 
So I think we could lock in with that. I don't okay. think it's right, but we're locked in with the Oilers. Uh, I did put the Oilers, but then I crossed it out and put the Flames yeah, ultimately. Right. But I, I really don't know, to be honest. Um, this was a little bit before I started getting into hockey. And, yeah. So the Flames did go to the final in t- uh, 2007 and lost to the Lightning. The answer to this question, though, was the Edmonton Oilers. Yeah. Oh, why did I cross it out, Neil? Tell me. I don't know. Tell 90, me why. 90 was the last uh, Gretzky year, right? Mm-hmm. The, yeah. yeah. I crossed it out because I need a hug. That's true. <laughs> Number seven, listen to yourself turn. Phonograph records were patented in 1857 by Leon Scott. 120 years later, a pair of records made of what material were launched into space in an act of interstellar hopefulness that Carl Sagan compared to launching a bottle into a cosmic ocean. Why would you say that? They were at least plated with that. Oh, you you know this. Yeah. Okay. Well, then lock in. Wasting my time. Oh, I thought it was one of those stories. <laughs> we are locked in. No. Are okay. In? Yeah. So um, I put ash. I put ashes, but are I thought they it was gold. A... Are they? Pl- it would have to be hard and so, durable. So not right? vinyl. Yeah. Titanium. Or maybe it just needs to be atomically stable. Or stable for a long. Period I thought of time. this was one of those weird stories where they were made of ashes and they like threw them in space no, or whatever. No. No. These are these are to. Uh, that's what I'm saving all my money to bump, for. To bump into aliens. <laughs> Oh, that's what, that's what they're trying so to they do. They could play on their gold-plated phonographs. Be like, "What Rigel the hell is 7. this?" Yeah, uh, let's go with gold. Gold, okay. Yeah, um, I don't know if they were plated or completely made of it, but I'm pretty sure these are gold. So, in some capacity, I believe they were entirely gold. But gold is the answer in any event. Gold. Oh. <laughs> 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 <To> be one. <laughs> Haven't had a chance to dust that reference off for a while. I love it. Number eight. World serves its own needs. With the troposphere that transitions smoothly into its liquid interior, which planet in our solar system has the densest atmosphere? Inhospitable clouds are arranged in bands at different latitudes, and conflicting circulation patterns cause turbulence and storms, including one anticyclonic storm that is reasonably famous. Yeah, we're good. Mm-hmm. No. No. I always do this. I write a, I write a planet down, and I look at Jeff, and he shakes his head. You're good? <laughs> we're good. So the, the big red eye is a famous uh, storm. Okay. On Jupiter. Yeah, Jupiter um, is pretty dense, right? Yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's like it, it's a gas planet. Okay. But I guess I guess it does fit the uh the question. I know Venus is pretty inhospitable mm-hmm. too in that way, but uh let's go Jupiter, I guess. The runaway greenhouse is not kind to of that planet. Yeah, let's go. It's us in like 100 million years. Yeah. Let's go Jupiter. Jupiter? Okay. Now with climate change, it's like 50 years. Right, right. So we're, we're getting there. But uh, I figured, yeah, this is a reference to the uh, Great Red Spot, which cosmically we're very fortunate because it's going away. Um, I mean, we'll long be dead before uh, it goes away. But <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> I have a Great Red Spot that I need to get checked out too. Uh-huh. I'll, I'll give it a look. <laughs> but uh, only if... Maybe you... when we're hugging. Yeah. <laughs> take a look. <laughs> just be shirtless and I'll just be peering into the red spot. It's but, a different uh, kind of video. It is. No, no, that's the brown spot. We'll, <laughs> this we'll is what our Patreon spot. videos are. <laughs> um, and so this is... Uh, we said Jupiter. It is Jupiter. In conclusion, let's, we said Jupiter. <laughs> yes. Let's, let's move on. Number nine. Don't misserve your own needs. Late last year, organizers of the Consumer Electronics Show withdrew an award from a female-run company called Laura DiCarlo for conflicting reasons. Some people said the product violated an immorality clause. Some just say the product didn't fit into an approved category. What type of products does Laura DiCarlo make, and for what market does she make them? I think think we're good. I just have to figure out how I'm going to explain it, but I know what it is. All right, we're locked. Oh man, this can go in a lot of bad directions. Yeah, I I don't remember anything from CES. Yeah. Last year, I don't really pay attention to that kind of stuff. No. So. What kind of stuff goes? Is that usually technology type stuff? Yeah, CES. It's yeah. Like consumer electronics. Um, oh, probably electronics. You're yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, but I mean, it could be anything. I mean, it could be some kind uh-huh. of. Uh, could be anything. I mean, anything that has you know electronic devices in it is eligible to be at CES. Okay. I mean, they demonstrate car technologies and phones and anything you could think of. So it could be some kind of phone could be it could be a health device it could be anything oh maybe it uh, that sounds familiar maybe it's like a like a fitbit and the, i feel like they might have a category for that that though now yeah but maybe this was a uh a fitbit unfit bit oh yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely and it like it shouts at you if you're not moving <laughs> enough are you guys uh, locked in yeah we yeah, said we the unfit bit all right well this uh we think is actually for your bits 
Yes, um, I'm going to mm. explain this poorly, but I believe I heard on a radio show when I was driving home from work that it was an adult product, uh, a, a sexual product, and vibrators. A vibrator, and they did not know where to put it um, in the. <laughs> 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 that is a different problem uh, than the categories. But uh, yeah, they didn't know where to place it in. <laughs> it's not getting any better. Our answer is vibrator. Vibrator and, and adult products. They they didn't know they didn't know what what where to put the booth in the conference center. You're right. Um, uh, that's right. <laughs> yeah, as as Neil so eloquently said, Lord De Carlo makes uh, female sex toys, sex toys for women. Uh, this American Life did a whole thing on it, which might have been what you heard recently. It is a feat in engineering, and I recommend everyone check it out because it is very educational. Right. Question 10. Speed it up. An experiment begun in 1927 at the University of Queensland in Brisbane demonstrated that some substances which appear solid are, in fact, highly viscous fluids. What is the two-word informal name of this experiment, which is the longest continuously running laboratory experiment in the world? The word experiment does not appear in the answer. I'm just going to guess. Okay. Go ahead, guess. So they basically have um, like pitch or tar, okay, and it's just <clears throat> dripping. That's all it's doing. Yeah. And they just monitor the flow rate, and it's very slow. Okay. Like it's, it's like stalactite. Slow flow. Stalagmite kind of stuff. Yeah. Ric Flair drip. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know where you can go with that. Uh, it, you know, it's a, uh, I think it's tar or something like okay. that, some kind of like pitch. Um, but I have no idea what the so, informal name of the experiment's called. Well, we locked in with tar trap. I don't know what that means. Uh, we're going to go with uh, state shift. All right, Jeff, you said all of the right words. It is the pitch drop experiment. Mm. Mm. Since 1927, the pitch has dropped nine times. It was in the news in 2013 because it was about to drop again, and it was really anticlimactic, but I believe they still have a webcam on it. They do. Yeah, That's something that Jeff would watch 100%. The one thing we can control in the studio here is when the bass drops. All right. All right. Well, it looks like uh, we're at 70 (laughs) points. Fastest way to cut away from a joke. Uh, 70. Yep. All All right. right. It's all tied up. Parody. We might all have to hug each other. Ooh. Oh, that'd be a that'd be oh, a very special be tied. Pick. Yeah, if it I is like a tie, that. then it's a it's got to be a quad hug. Tie for goes sure. to the hugger. Yeah. Is it? I don't know if that means anything. Hey, let's go to the swing round. Is that what we're doing? Yeah, it is. All right. There's a line in the song about book burning, and this week uh, marks the beginning of banned books week. So what I have are ten books that have been banned for certain definitions of the word banned in different places, libraries, countries. Just these are books that have been made inaccessible. I'm going to give you the year it was published, the genre of the book, and a quick reason for the ban. Okay. Number one, 1963 children's literature was banned because it was too dark, because it could be traumatizing due to the protagonist's inability to control his emotions. Number two, 1947 nonfiction was banned for depictions of curiosity about the female body and homosexual tendencies. Number three. 1993 Young Adult Fiction is banned for depictions of infanticide and sexual awakening. There's a theme. Number four, 1987 Puzzle Book. If you look very closely on the edge of a page, you can see a tiny dot that was supposed to be a nipple. Number five, 1948 Short Story was banned in apartheid era South Africa because they understood the short story was not saying nice things about blindly following tradition. Number six, 1957 novel, was published in Italy because it was refused publication by the USSR. It romanticized the pre-revolution upper class and degraded peasants and workers. Number seven, 2011 fan fiction, banned for intense sexual situations and fears that impressionable teens might try it. Number eight, 411 BCE, it's a play, It was considered obscene in A.D. 66 and then was banned in 1873 due to offensive themes about the power of women. Nine. 1903, Russian propaganda. It is astoundingly anti-Semitic. It is a literary hoax. Hitler was a big fan and so are modern Nazis. And 10. 1852, it is a novel. Defenders of slavery took exception to its depictions and claimed it was inaccurate. 
All right, so we've had some time to think, and uh, we've got our answers. But before we give them, we'd like to just quickly remind everybody about our store. Right, Neil? Yeah, that's right. Uh, our friend Taylor over at inkedandscreened.com uh, is our official supplier of merchandise. And uh, you can go there. You can get some great items, some T-shirts. Uh, there's some new things, though, that are uh, entering the store, new designs, some new totes. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a limited edition T-shirt uh, that you can only get with a promo code uh, discounted offer from our Bloodsport series. So if you check out the YouTube, uh, the live version. The YouTubes. The YouTubes. <laughs> Uh, 100 can, years old. Yeah, the YouTube. Yeah, my tote bag. I'm on the YouTube. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can uh, you can get the code there. Uh, but uh, what's also great is if you're a Patreon supporter at the uh, United States level or higher, you also get a uh, percentage off code, 25% uh, off all merchandise. So maybe you're just looking for something with our classic logo. You already have a Triviality T-shirt, but you know what? Got to get into, that tote. We're getting into that fall season. Oh winter yeah, winter season. Ooh, Triviality hoodie sounds good a about chilly. now. Ooh, Jeff right. and I were just on the phone with Taylor, who's been awesome. They have been making uh, leggings for a yoga event, and we talked about maybe getting a uh, a pair of leggings, Triviality leggings. Just one pair. I'd wear them. <laughs> five thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I'll if 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 we do put them in the store and at least ten people buy them, I will wear wear them in the studio for recording. And Ken will. Did we ever put up that good. picture of you wearing that one Triviality shirt that was three sizes too small? We did, and people were disappointed it didn't look as bad. Uh, I guess. Yeah, that's fair. That's what Tara said. Tara Whittle. So. All right. Well, let's get to the the uh, answers. All right. Number one, 1963 children's literature, Too Dark. What did y'all say? Yeah, this was tough for uh, me and Neil over at Cherry Pie. Uh, we haven't read this book, but we think it's dark. Uh, Flowers for Algernon. Yeah, we, we couldn't quite remember which one this one was. We know it appears on quite a few banned book lists for, you know, for whoever knows nebulous reasons. Uh, we said To Kill a Mockingbird. Right. It is where the wild things are. Oh wow! Hmm. Oh, okay. the children's I book. I can <laughs> see it now. He does go to bed without supper. Kind of dark. He does. Yeah. <laughs> Number two, nineteen forty-seven nonfiction: Curiosity of the Female Body and Homosexual Tendencies. Oh no! What'd you guys say? I believe this one is the Diary of Anne Frank. Hmm. Oh really? Um, we didn't know. We guessed something in the uh, in the early. Actually, I don't know. How did we come to this one? Uh, you said a thing, and I agreed. Yeah, we we took a guess. We said the feminine mystique. Ooh, no, it was Diary of Anne Frank. Three, 1993, young adult fiction, infanticide, and sexual awakening. Uh, we've talked about this one on the show a couple times. Uh, we think it might be The House on Mango Street. Oh, that's a good answer. Uh, this is a book that I've read a lot, and it's not the right answer. We said Animorphs. <laughs> <laughs> nope. It was The Giver. Oh yeah! Oh. oh, that totally makes sense. I forgot about the uh, infanticide in that. I, I thought I that book. I thought that book was earlier for sure. No, yeah, but it's Lowry, right? Lois Lowry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. She wrote a couple sequels that were not as good. The Taker. But that one has held up. Yeah, I love The Giver. <laughs> Four. Nineteen eighty-seven puzzle book. If you look close, you can see a nipple. Mm -hmm. We said, uh, "Where's Waldo?" Mm -hmm. We're also looking for Waldo. It was Where's Waldo? All right. Oh man, I thought we were just joking, but that's great. It's either that or I Spy, which yeah, would be a funnier said, yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. It was in the beach scene. Uh, nineteen forty eight short story banned in apartheid South Africa. I enjoyed listening to y'all discuss this. I don't know what you landed on. Yeah, we thought this was probably something that didn't have to do with apartheid or South Africa at all, but was probably just like a, a tale about standing out from the crowd. Um, we couldn't really come up with a good answer, but we said, uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Okay. Interesting. We were thinking, uh, who was writing short stories in that, in that time frame um, that are maybe slightly contentious, so we just thought of the first Hemingway short story we could think of. We said, Snows of Kilimanjaro. Uh, not a bad guess. Uh, no, it was Shirley Jackson's The Lottery. Oh. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was about blindly following tradition and everyone being horrified by it. I don't know that book at all. I think it's all available online it's worth a read six 1957 novel published in italy because it was refused publication by the ussr we discussed uh dr Shivago, war and peace and uh we didn't think those were correct and we actually landed on anna karenina oh. uh, we also we didn't know we kind of were just thinking of uh books banned books, and banned yeah. books that kind of fit that theme and we said animal farm all right, you guys said it and then didn't go with it. It was Dr. Zhivago. Oh, man. We are not doing well. I didn't think that, that... So would that be a lean score? <laughs> yeah, it's a lean score. Uh, I didn't feel that Dr. Zhivago fit that theme. Uh, 
all that well, but uh, okay. Full disclosure, I haven't read it. That's just what Wikipedia told me. I mean, wow. I've seen the movies. They took some liberties from what Maybe I Maybe I don't remember it correctly. Oh, yeah. Or I could be wrong. It happens, but you guys are wrong more than I am, so. <laughs> we are very wrong on that question. Number seven, 2011 fan fiction where an impressionable young teenagers might try what was written about in the book. Mm. I've tried everything in that book, and it's uh, <laughs> Fifty Shades of Grey. The Whip, too? Yeah. <laughs> and the Nene? <laughs> <laughs> It's fan fiction of the greatest book ever written, Twilight. Uh, the answer is Fifty Shades of Grey. Yeah. My mom gave me that book to read. I did not read it. Can, can anybody explain to me That's how, a weird recommend. how oh, it's yeah. a fanfic of Twilight when it doesn't share any characters or themes? No, well, the, the original fan fiction, their names were from their Twilight characters. But they were just totally different characters with the same names? No, I mean, the, they were more, they were vampires and whatnot. Okay. Yeah, Christian Grey is just is just Edward Cullen and yeah. kind of his controlling nature over uh, Bella. 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 All right, thanks for explaining. I think I think when she wanted to get it published, she realized that she had to make some tweaks. Yeah, and I and I don't think it was available at CES. Please don't say tweak right now. <laughs> Sorry. All right, four eleven BC considered obscene in AD sixty six and eighteen seventy three again due to offensive themes about the power of women. Yeah, uh, I, I believe this is right. I could be wrong. Uh, it was a play Colleen was in. She played the title character. Uh, it's a really cool storyline about uh, women uh, giving up sex to force men to stop fighting and not have any wars. And I believe it's Liz Estrada. Um, we went a slightly different direction. Um, a much funnier uh, tragedy. Um, one woman in particular had quite a lot of power. Uh, we said Oedipus Rex. Oh, yeah, it was Liz Estrada. Yeah. Forgot about that. Oedipus Rex, uh, Oedipus the King, uh, more importantly, I have to correct you this time, yeah. uh, is one of my favorite plays. So, yeah. <laughs> Neil's really into <laughs> 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 I'm just yeah. going gonna, gonna to gouge my ears out along with my eyes, just like Oedipus after hearing that go. one. Number nine, 1903, Russian propaganda, astoundingly anti-Semitic. Uh, we couldn't come up with this one. Uh, unfortunately, we went with the incorrect answer of Mein Kampf, which was written by Hitler. So how could he be inspired by it? Yeah, he'd be a big fan of it, though. Uh, we weren't 100% sure, so we said uh, the classic Pride and Prejudice and Nazis. <laughs> All right. No, this one was kind of a deep cut. Uh, that work was called The Protocols of the Elders of Zion. That's right. And it is about um, a Jewish... It's a Jewish plot to take over the world. It's completely fabricated, but a lot of anti-Semitic people point towards it as the reason that they are anti-Semitic. So, yeah. Number 10. 1852 novel, Defenders of Slavery, took exception to it because it was, quote, inaccurate. Yep. This is another one where we had some trouble on it. Um, we we haven't read this book, uh, but we know it has some themes of slavery, and uh, we don't really know where it falls, but we went with uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Mm-hmm. So it's, uh, Frederick Douglass, right? Is that Harry so, Beecher Stowe is the, close. is the author? No, that's not close at all. <laughs> <laughs> I said I was close, but yeah, we said Uncle Tom's Cabin, and it was Uncle Tom's cab- Cabin. So ending on a high note. Oh. Yeah. All right. Kind well, of. that was rough. Let's get back to questions y'all know the answers to. At the end of that round, uh, Cherry Pie has a slight lead with ninety-five points. By Lamos uh, mm. lost a little ground with eighty-five points. Mm. Sad. That's all I have. Just let the rhythm take you over, man. Yeah. I want to change my name now. Can we be Kiss from a Rose? Sure. Yeah, yes. why not? All Just right. change it. We are now. Round two, question one. The other night I dreamt of knives. Irma's injection is the name of a dream by what neurologist and pioneer of dream analysis. Despite what you may think, the dream had nothing to do with what is or is not a cigar. Who's doing Who's doing dreams? Freddy. Freud is a huge mm-hmm. dream okay. person. Freddy Krueger. Yes, Freddy Krueger is definitely doing dreams. Mm-hmm. Uh, Leonardo some, DiCaprio in that one movie. Some Carl Jung. <laughs> Holland Oates. Oh. That's one guy, right? Holland yes, Oates. get out of my dream, right? <laughs> Into my car. <laughs> That's a different guy, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> Where are these cigars clues? It's about Bill Clinton. Maybe. Yes, famed dream analysis pioneer, William Jefferson Clinton. Well, he's, is this, he's uh, is this a cigar. No Cigar by Millen <laughs> That's a reference for no one. Uh, do you want to say <laughs> Freud? Sure. Yeah, Freud. Yep, Freud. It is Freud. All right. All that talk. Much ado nothing. about nothing. <laughs> Freud famously may not have said sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Oh. Poorly written reference to. Number two, Continental Drift Divide. 
Due to the action of plate tectonics, continents move around the planet at a rate of about one inch per year. Before they started to wander, the continents existed as one continuous landmass known by what name? All right. I knew one. Which time? Oh, my God, Jeff. <laughs> the worst. <laughs> the one that you're thinking of. Just write it down. Just say the one. Fine. You are going to be kicked off of Pangea. You're no longer welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I, too, said Pangea. It is Pangea. I have a regular who is an earth science professor who asked me the exact same damn question. I told him the same thing. Like, just write down the one you know I want. God, Wanda is not acceptable as an answer. <laughs> no, just because you do it with attitude. Number three, mountains sit in a line. The Salathe Wall, the Dawn Wall, Free Rider, and often Alex Honnold are found on what specific geologic feature, which is part of this year in Nevada Mountains? My inroad to this is really dumb, though. Okay. We're locked in with your answer. Do you know about this stuff? Not really. I. So the, uh, Alex Honnold is the free climber that they did that documentary about? Oh, Free Solo? Free Solo, yeah. yeah. So uh, Free Rider, I can't remember if that was the one he did in in the documentary Mm -hmm. i think it was a different one i don't know if she's looking for the name of the one that he did in the documentary or what kind of feature it is but either way they're all rock faces that are climbable oh okay uh without that you have to climb without any no not necessarily but let's just say uh cliff face okay yeah, I wrote down uh, that tall, straight wall slash cliff, uh, mountains climb. Wait, wait, the, 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 the straight, tall cliff? Well, yes, yes. Very famous to Sierra Nevada. And, well, uh, there are a couple. Okay, so. well, that would have helped if we talked it out, but we didn't. Um, so we didn't know. So what did you write down? That um, so one of the features I'm pretty confident people um, are attracted to in the Sierra Nevada is this half dome. So we said half dome. All right, so you were on the right track with half dome. It's El Capitan. Where I was trying to go with this is the last six Mac OS releases are all Sierra Nevada based. Oh. So they have like the background for one is going to be Half Dome. El Capitan that was, was like one. the yeah. OS 10. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. Like 0.7 release or 8 release, something like that. Fair enough. So hmm. I was just trying to go through all those because I knew they were just basically shooting stuff in their backyard at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Screwed that one up. So, oh, well, I had no idea. So it's fine with me. <laughs> Question four, Leonard Bernstein is credited with the modern revival of what Austro-Bohemian romantic composer? In 1960, Bernstein conducted the New York Philharmonic for a festival to celebrate the centenary of the composer's birth. And on November 23rd, 1963, he conducted this composer's Resurrection Symphony as a memoir for JFK. I wrote somebody, but he's not. I believe he's Italian. Okay. Maybe. I'm, I don't know if I'll come up with anyone better than I that. I have a couple other guesses. Write, write, write them down and I'll circle the one I like. And then I'll, I'll pull a Neil. If it's wrong, it's I'm going to... Yeah. Yeah. Um, Wagner, Brahms, Gershwin. Yeah, I, it's interesting you say Gershwin because I know in Manhattan... I say Gershwin's American, right? I think, born yeah. in New York? But I'm just thinking of... I, for some reason, I thought like Bernstein, Bernstein um, conducted a symphony that for Manhattan. That seems like it would but, fit in well with Bernstein's repertoire, but... Yeah, but no, that, that I'd rather, yeah, we're going with someone, I think, who's not American, so that Wagner. makes sense. Yeah. Wagner. Um, we had thought about Wagner, but uh, ultimately we settled on Liszt. So. Right, well, unfortunately, no points. I think Bernstein's efforts to revive this artist did not go far enough. It was Gustav Mahler. One that one that Ken is always trying to, he's, it, we've mentioned him before, but for other things where we can't remember who he is or what he does, <laughs> so that's pretty fitting. Number five, Leonid Brezhnev. In 1964, a plot led to the installation of Leonid Brezhnev as the General Secretary of the Soviet Union. Although this appointment was meant to be temporary, Brezhnev held the office until his death in 1982. He replaced which Russian politician who was responsible for the Soviet space program and the de-Stalinization of the Soviet Union? This is a, a good game for Ken, I feel like. He's, he's been on top of these. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something that I would normally ask of Neil. Can you think of any movies or film that would have taken place in the, or, 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 or around the 1950s? No. Uh, about about Russia? <laughs> well, that would, have had, that would have had the Soviet leader in there. Because uh, we're looking for the leader between Stalin and Brezhnev. But, that, uh, that movie about the... But I can't remember. No, I don't know. We can whiff. I mean... Yep. We don't know. Kind of get mad if I sit here for 20 minutes. All right. Okay. Well, uh, I think uh, Jeff was. <laughs> this is so funny because it is because of a movie, yeah. uh, The Death of Stalin. Um, Malenkov took over after Stalin briefly, and then I believe he was replaced by Khrushchev. 
Yeah. Uh, and then Brezhnev, I believe. So yeah. Khrushchev. That makes sense. Khrushchev is correct. Wow, wow. Did you hear all that stuff I knew about Russian politics? That was good stuff. Wow. Who is the How famous Russian politician with the... Jeffrey uh, Tambor. <laughs> so the, the movie I was trying to think yeah, of actually was, uh, is it uh, 13 Days? Yeah, that's, that's with JFK. Because yeah. Khrushchev is still around then. Yeah, that that's was, Kevin Costner, yeah. yeah. Um, they talk about that because obviously he's deploying troops to uh, Cuba. Who was the, the Russian Cuban politician Cuban. I'm trying to think of that had the birthmark that dealt with like Reagan? Gorbachev. 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 Oh, yeah, that's right. Mr. Gorbachev, yeah, tear, tear down, down that wall. wall. Yeah, that's right. Okay, thank you. I haven't done a gipper in a while. Y'all done? Yeah. Uh, we're never All done. right. I didn't want to step on you. Number six, Lenny Bruce. We learned in round one that Lenny Bruce was not afraid of being convicted of obscenity. The phrase I know it when I see it was written by in a 1964 Supreme Court case about the definition of obscenity. Who was the chief justice of the Supreme Court at that time? He was governor of California before his elevation, and he presided over the court from 1953 to 1969. His name has become almost synonymous with the major leaps in civil rights and liberties in American law. Okay, we're locked in. Uh... I don't. Think, I I'm so bad with Supreme Ken Court. Ken was too justices. busy focusing on Russian politics to yeah. think of American ones. You go ahead with. Yeah, I I have no idea. I'm just trying to think of someone who's around that time. I I'm just I wrote down Marshall, Thurgood Marshall, but I don't. I we don't. Can, we can say that I really have no idea. I don't about either. That time range. So it's one of two. We we narrowed it down to. I can't remember which one it is. We couldn't remember if it was the Burger Court or the Warren Court, and we went Burger. Oh, we should have gone Warren. Oh, no. Or was, Warren. Isn't Earl the Moore. Burger Court a nice, uh, nice restaurant at, down at the mall? I'm not feeling up for jokes anymore, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> and, if, and if you're unsure of uh, what combo you should get, you'll know it when you see it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that was good. I, I will tip my hat to you, sir. Number seven. Lester Bangs is name-checked in the song There's Nothing Wrong With Hating Rock Critics by what indie pop band that, somewhat deceptively, is actually based in Athens, Georgia? So who'd you say? The Killers? Maybe. I think they're from Vegas. Oh. Yeah, I think you're right. All right, we're going to lock in. Okay, so I originally wrote of Montreal because that would be ironic if they were from Athens and they were of Montreal. But I know that Manchester Orchestra is from Athens, Georgia, and you would think they might be from Manchester, which I did the first time I saw them open uh, for Brand New, and they did not have British accents. Um, so <laughs> we're going to lock in with Manchester Orchestra. And we just said the Strokes. You guys, Matt and Jeff, are hurting yourselves. The answer was of Montreal. Ugh. Ugh. I've never even heard of that band, so they're either they're um, semi big. I think I think they were on Saddle Creek for a while hmm. with some of those other bands. Question eight: Category birthday party cheesecake. What California-based ice cream company has among its twenty-six-ish flavors birthday cake and strawberry cheesecake? This company's heavenly hook is that a pint of their ice cream contains between two hundred and forty and three hundred and sixty calories. We can lock in. Good. Um, I know Blue Bunny is ice cream, but the one that has low caloric count, I believe, is um, Skinny Cow. Skinny Cow. Yeah. You can go Skinny Cow. Oh, but you said that these were heavenly, and when I think of heavenly, I think of Halo Top. Oh, I believe it's Halo Top. It is Halo Top. Yeah. I wouldn't have pulled that, but when he said it, <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's really good. I ate a pint of it all by myself last week when I got offered a new job. It was totally worth it. Oh, congratulations. Great. Yeah. Eating the ice cream. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Number nine, jelly bean. In the slang of the 1910s and 20s, a jelly bean referred to a man who dressed stylishly but had little else of substance. In 1920, five years before he published his most famous work, which American author published a short story called The Jelly Bean? What did you think you were on to over there? <laughs> yeah, you're a jelly bean. <laughs> <laughs> What a great insult. I think I talked to a lady on the phone who was so old that she still had the uh, transatlantic accent the other day. She sounded like Catherine Hepburn. <laughs> oh, at, at work? At work, yeah. Well, I'm going to need you to, need you to uh, cut off the tree there. Come clean my gutters. Clean my gutters, please. <laughs> and I don't mean in a sexual manner. <laughs> uh, uh, what was the second? Cary ha- Grant told me I had a nice pair of gams. <laughs> And then I cooked them some yams. So this was five years before their most famous work. It was a short story written in 1920. That's what you needed to know. Mm-hmm. Okay. And what was the type of author you said? I, that's what I wanted to hear. American. That, yeah, that might fit. Right, yeah. We're locked in. All right. Whose most famous work would be in 1925? Um, is that like uh, the jungle era? What am I? What am I looking at here? Uh, books? I don't know. 
1925. Uh, Things were going great on Wall Street, right? <laughs> And I, <laughs> Everyone yeah, was feeling good. 1925, the era, before the crash. Yeah, uh, the era of good is that a Scott Fitzgerald, Great Gatsby kind of a thing? I th- originally thought Gatsby. Ooh, but well, we can go Gatsby. Oh, so, do we need the word? Or the author? No, author. author. F- we'll go F. Scott Fitzgerald. Yeah. All right. Good guess, old sport. We were thinking of somebody who might want to punch out a jelly bean. Uh, Hemingway. All right. Well, the good news for Matt and Jeff is y'all did not cross out the right answer this time. It was Fitzgerald. Yay. Mm. F. Scott Fitzgerald. We've been good at that lately. <laughs> I'd love to see <laughs> Ernest Hemingway drunk yelling at a jelly bean in his office. <laughs> With all his six-toed cats. And number 10, boom. Begin in February of 1964, a U.S. city endured over 1,200 sonic booms as the FAA ran tests to determine how a city would be affected by a barrage of such booms. The city was greatly affected and testing ceased six months later. However, the legacy endures. This city's professional sports team and a drive-in restaurant headquartered there have names that may or may not allude to these tests. What is that city? Oh, locked in. It's too much. So it's Seattle, right? Yeah. 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 I was like, wait. <laughs> They're like, like blowing windows out of houses. Bad. That's yeah. How, yeah. Didn't yeah. We go said well. Seattle. Yeah. Oh, you both said Seattle? That's unfortunate. The answer is Oklahoma City. So I wrote Oklahoma City. No. And then I, uh, I got caught up on Sonic's. And they moved to Oklahoma City. <laughs> yeah. Sonic is headquartered in Oklahoma City. Yeah. Is it? Hmm. Interesting. Score. And I say may or may not be because I've heard the stories both ways. I couldn't find um, hardcore validation either way, whether it was actually like the Thunder and Sonic were named for the Sonic boom testing. But I like the story. So I asked the question. Fair enough. The stakes are high going into the final round because it appears All we're right. both tied at 125. This should be fun. Your final categories are... It's time I had some time alone. Two, it's the end of the world as we know it. Three, it's the end of the world as we know it. Four, it's the end of the world as we know it. And five, and I feel fine. I do not feel fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, all the wagers are in at this time. So let's get the questions. Question one, it's time I had some time alone. When the Post Malone song Take What You Want debuted at number eight on the Billboard Hot 100 this week, its featured artist took the record for longest gap between Billboard Hot 100 top 10 songs. This artist, whose last top 10 hit was in 1989, saw his career take off after he went solo in 1979 when his previous band fired him. Who is that artist? Number two, it's the end of the world as we know it. The Hollow Men is a 1925 poem that has nothing to do with cats, but that gave us the line, this is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. What poet penned these words? God damn it. Number three, it's the end of the world as we know it. The End of the World was a 2003 viral video that if you don't remember it, you should drop what you're doing and go watch it. This video ended with a harsh criticism of what animal, which appears on national coats of arms and currency. Number four, it's the end of the world as we know it. R.E.M. disbanded in September of 2011 after a prolific and Hall of Fame worthy career. Their song, What's the Frequency, Kenneth, is being re-released this year for its 25th anniversary. The title references a 1986 incident when what high-profile journalist was assaulted by someone repeatedly asking him that question. Number five, and I feel fine. Tomorrow, I shall no longer be here are the last words of what Uh, What astrologer who lived in the 1500s? Say what you will about the rest of his work. His prediction was correct, and he died that night. All right, we'll think about the answers, and we'll be right back. All the answers are locked in, and uh, again, it's been a, a tight game. It's tied right now, 125 to 125, so let's see how these shook out. All right, it's time I had some time alone. Which artist who went solo after his band fired him in 1979, now holds the record for longest gap between Billboard Top 10 hits. All right, so uh, spoilers, we bet 10 all the way down. So for this first one, I just had a hunch it might be Lionel Richie. Ah, We we wagered 15 all the way down, so a little bit more there. Um, I'm pretty sure that this is someone who was fired from Black Sabbath in 1979 and had his own hits in 1989. I think this is Ozzy Osbourne. It is Ozzy Osbourne. Current events. Number two, it's the end of the world as we know it. Not with a bang, but a whimper. What poet wrote that? Again, for 10, um, we think you said something about cats here. And Neil said, well, if it has to do with cats, probably T.S. Eliot. 
Yeah. Um, I don't remember why I would know that particularly, but we settled on T.S. Eliot. Y'all picked up on the hint. That is T.S. Eliot. Nothing to do with cats. Number three. The End of the World was a 2003 viral video. It ended with a harsh criticism of what animal? And uh, it was it was difficult to bring this uh, to the surface of my memory because it's been a while since I've seen this one. But I think he says something about f- kangaroos or something like mm-hmm. that. So we said uh, kangaroos for 10. Yeah, so this um, I was really trying to think of which one this was. And I'm pretty sure it's the one where they all shoot nuclear missiles at each other and Australia is off by itself. And then at the end, he's just mad about the kangaroos. So we said kangaroos. Kangaroos is correct. I rewatched it when I was writing this question. It It holds up. Yeah. And I'm like, dame. This is, yeah, this, <laughs> this is the one where the French say, I'm le tired, right? I'm le tired, that, yeah. That's yep. where it comes from. Well, so have a nap. And then fire <laughs> missiles. Yeah, it's great. Oh, I do know that one. Yeah. 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 I'm like, there's no way. Y'all are not that much younger than me. There's no way yeah. you missed this. We have all seen it, right. yes. Yeah, we had time in computer lab in middle I'm, school. That's right. <laughs> right, yeah. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> Number four. It's the end of the world as we know it. Uh What's the frequency Kenneth references a 1986 incident when what high-profile journalist was accosted by a man asking him that question? Who was that journalist? Uh, being a Ken, I would be remiss if I did not know it was Dan Rather. Mm. This is one that we went back and forth on because we always pick the wrong guy when we're between Tom Brokoff and Dan Rather, but this time we went with Dan Rather. All right. And I feel fine. Tomorrow I shall no longer be here. Who said that right before he died? Uh, I'm going to try to say this after this game um, and see if it works. But uh, <laughs> I think the guy who is always predicting <laughs> is Nostradamus. <laughs> yeah, uh, we said famed predictor. Maybe not always right. Nostradamus. And Nostradamus is correct. Nice work. I predict that we have lost this game. but Hold uh, on, wait for the math. But let's do the final tallies. We did get them all right. So. Oh, you were perfect that round. Yeah, you're right. Mm-hmm. We're perfect every round, Neil. Uh, <laughs> nope. Not, a, not an answering, but... And I've uh, crunched the numbers here. It looks like we at Cherry Pie have uh, measly 155, mm. whereas uh, Kiss by the Rose, is that what you went with? Kiss by a Rose? <laughs> yes. We changed yeah. to, yeah. Celebrating uh, our bicentennial over here. With 200, you're the cream of the crop. I am the cream. Feels but, good. But you know what? The joke's on you, because me and Neil, we're going to get some loving from each other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we will. I'm not. I'm okay with it. Well, we'll make sure the video cuts away before any of that happens. And of course, we'll keep it. Patreon bonus <laughs> we'll exclusives are nuts. So yeah. please join our Patreon. And uh, of course, we all love Aaron here as well. And we love that you wrote a game for us today. And it was great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys for having me. This was fun. And we're always happy to have you sending uh, Skyping in or if, if you're visiting, have you in the studio. Yeah. So before we let you go, is there anything else you wanted to mention? Sure. Uh, myself and my co-host Brent Bollmeyer host a sports trivia podcast. It is exactly what it sounds like. So if that appeals to you, check us out on wherever you get your podcasts. And if you ever happen to be in the Richmond, Virginia area, I host a trivia weekly trivia game. I play test these questions with my regulars, so I appreciate them for letting me do this. And also, if you happen to ever get in trouble in Virginia, give me a call because that's my day job is defending people who get in trouble in Virginia. We know so many lawyers as though. a superhero. Right. Oh. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I feel like across the United States that we have a, a, a we've amassed a network where we can get in trouble almost anywhere yeah. and have some support. Carte blanche. Yeah. I mean, we're not rich enough for carte blanche, but well, I carte do in- blanche. <laughs> <laughs> I do intend to get in trouble uh, nationally. So yeah, <laughs> it's a good goal. It sounds dangerous. Yeah. All right. Thanks again to Aaron. Uh, thank you to my co-hosts Neil, Jeff, and Matt. My name is Ken. That was Triviality. Would that make you uh, Ken, National Man of Mystery? That's right. <laughs>trying to prove me wrong that Hugh Laurie was on the show. He was not, just for the record. <laughs> I was just curious. I didn't remember him being in it. So I was like... Real-time mansplaining from Jeff. <laughs> Jeff is a black adder. I don't know what a black adder is, but it yeah, sounds like Jeff. For sure. Has less venom than me. Let's get back to the question. Hold on. Correction. Uh, Hugh Laurie was not on that show, mm. but uh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Question uh, four, please. <laughs>